uh, let's talk about chapter 14 of Stoner, where Stoner kicks ass! <laughs> Takes names! I actually know. Um, well, to begin with, Stoner is really ill. Um, Catherine Driscoll, the end of the last chapter, his his love, the woman, the young woman that he was having an affair with, uh, due to the machinations of a Lom Hollis Lomax, the head of the English department who Stoner is made complete enemy of, um, has, um, she's been driven, she's been driven out. She's been driven out by Lomax's machinations. They were going to expose her, uh, basically held her up to ridicule. She resigned. She leaves, which it is one of the, the, the kind of sh the shitty things of like, yep, older man has an affair with younger woman. Young woman has to leave. And, uh, this, I don't quite sure exactly how much that's going to mess up her, her, uh, career going forward. Um, you know, you wonder, Ho I hopefully we'll maybe circle back around to Catherine Driscoll. That would be, that would be nice. Um, stoner is ill. He doesn't teach over that summer. He's, uh, he visibly ages. He gets more and more stooped all through this novel. It's more and more, more and more stooped, more and more. And he visibly ages, you know, you, you can see that someone has gone from being kind of the vibrancy of kind of a middle age going into maybe going into old age. Um, and when he gets back to school again, he's got that same super, super shitty schedule spread out. It's like, it's, it's four or five, uh, freshman, freshman English, English cl classes where you get a whole bunch of students who don't want to be there. Just have to take it for the requirement. You're teaching the same basic one-on-one stuff over and over again with people who probably can't write. Cause I sure couldn't write, uh, coming out of high school. I mean, maybe they were better educational standards back then. Uh, and it's all, yeah, it's spread all o out over six days. So, uh, it's, it's really shitty. And he looks at it and goes, gets, he's got the syllabus there, the same goddamn syllabus every single time of, you know, probably introduction, introductory English, you know, sur in English survey stuff, takes it all, tosses it in the trash and goes upon a, a, a scheme of where he, um, he, he says, ah, no, we're going to take a little different approach to introductory English. And he starts teach, we're going to talk, teach, uh, introductory English, uh, through the, uh, through the lens of medieval literature and language, which is his specialty and the thing that he's actually interested in. Uh, and the students are like, what the fuck's going on here? And it's like, yes. And I want you to do a essay on, um, on, uh, Aristotle and, uh, topis or topic by uh, Monday and you know here's some reading to do to do that uh, predictably he goes by uh, Lomax's office and there's a whole ton of st his students outside the thing obviously and they're all trying not to look at him they complain to him uh Lomax is like I you know still is like I don't want to talk to him so he gets a recent hire of his uh, a 30 year old baldish guy who it's quickly, who is apparently quickly just r realized that he's yeah, affable young man, good mannered, uh, but has, uh, no talent and, uh, n no aptitude for teaching. So he gets put in charge of the teachers. Of course, that's what happens to, to professors like that. It's interesting that Lomax seems to be really stalking his, his, uh, faculty with a lot of not really that great, great of people, uh, whatever his, measurements for getting people or whether it's accolades for his his own brilliance that he's looking for so he can be the one that shines or whatever but again someone who's pretty much pretty pretty third fourth rate um and he goes like well we don't want you to do that and it's like really really i'm a tenured professor are you is is he trying to actually interfere in how i teach my classes because that would be quite dangerous you know and lomax apparently has storms to uh, finch tries to get him to do something and he's like and he just starts laughing Lo <laughs> Finch laughs at him and says like I'm not going to do it you you have to do your own job and uh, you can't do anything about it at which point at the very end of this chapter he is re he gets next next um next semester he's back teaching an actual proper kind of spread of courses he has won he has won some sort of victory over over uh, Lomax all without ever actually having seen him whether it's through and i mean he's he's in some ways he's somewhat disinterested in it it was a triumph in a way but one of which he always re remained remained assuredly contemptuous as if it were a victory 
won by boredom and indifference. It's like, it's sort of one of these things of like, he'd lost, he, he's lost the woman he loves. It's like, I don't give a fuck anymore. Um, but he has actually kind of rediscovered that interest in, um, in the stuff that he is interested in, in this med- medieval language and literature and this kind of, this kind of the core, the studying of the core stuff. Um, also in this chapter, um, we get, we do get these things of like, you know, what time period we're in. Uh, it's very much, we've gotten uh, pre, pre-World War II, so we're height of depression. And he's reminded that he is somebody who, he grew up in privation, in leanness, in, in desperate times himself. So that when the rest of the world joins him in that, and, you know, he, he sees all these people starving, men begging for a piece of bread so that they will be able to live to beg for another piece of bread the next day. He knows that. And I mean, he also can see the anger of those people when they look at someone like him who is sheltered uh, in this, in this institution that seems cannot fail. Mm -hmm. Cannot fail. Uh, Also, he's very much reminded of uh, his mentor, uh, uh, Arthur and um, him, him looking at um, coming um coming him coming from him coming from um Arthur Archer <laughs> Arthur Archer Sloan uh which is like it's one of these things of like you look at you look at uh Stoner and you think is he basically become his mentor his mentor seems to have been somebody who was very kind of ground down who couldn't bridge that gap between what he kind of felt about like his love of literature and the students that he had and it kind of the that kind of the souring that did for him. And it's like, is that who he is turning into? And you do wonder, especially at the beginning of the chapter, it's like, Oh, that's what he's going to be teaching freshman, uh, freshman classes. And, you know, never, never kind of never be being able to bridge that thing, except very, very rarely. And which, I mean, I think bridging that bridging that divide is a rare thing in itself. Unless you're a freaking genius, but you know, it's it's one of those things of of um, it's like he also became aware aware of the war in Europe and like the gathering war, and he thought he thought of Dave Masters who you know died in that war, but he also thinks of Archer Sloan and how Archer Sloan was looking at it from the perspective of somebody who had was just born around the time of the Civil War who had lost his own relatives in the Civil War, who then watched people go off to World War One and kind of knew. You know, and they're all there's all this fervent patriot patriotism, and he's like he's not swept up in that because he knows what's going to happen. There's going to be a lot of death. There's going to a lot of be a lot of damaged people coming back, and all that sort of thing. And it's it's interesting as Archer Sloan had done, he realized the futility and waste of committing oneself wholly to the irrational and dark forces that impel the world towards its unknown, its unknown end. Uh, this is page. Uh, 220. As Archer Sloan had not done, Stoner withdrew a little distance to pity and love, so that he was not caught in the rushing that he observed. As in other moments of crisis and despair, he looked again to the cautious faith that embodied, that was embodied in the institution of the university. He told himself that it was not much, but he knew that it was all he had. So, I mean, he really is a university man. There is very much that kind of thing of a monk in a, you know, in, a, in, in kind of the institution of the church, we have this scholar in the institution of the university. And it's interesting that, you know, that Archer Sloan is able to, that unlike Archer Sloan, he's, he withdrew a little bit distance into pity, to pity and love. Like he's got that access to that, which I don't know if Archer Sloan uh, did, which maybe makes why Stoner is that richer, a little bit richer of a character. We also have at the very beginning of the chapter when, when he is sick uh, in interaction with Edith, um, who she's such an she's such kind of an interesting, seemingly limited character. Um, I heard I, I just heard in the middle of summer, uh, she spoke of Catherine. I heard just a day or so ago, she said, so your little co-ed has gone, has she? And it's like. With an effort, he brought his attention away from the window and turned to Edith. Yes, he said mildly. What was her name? Edith asked. I can never remember her name. Catherine, he said. Catherine Driscoll. Oh, yes, Edith said. Catherine Driscoll. Well, you see, 
I told you, didn't I? I told you that these things weren't important. Which is, that's sort of Edith. These things aren't important. Um, she, uh, I mean, you know, as much as you can feel sorry for Stoner, I feel more sorry for the world and the person that Edith Edith Stoner is uh, in this world. Uh, you know, you can only kind of, you, you, you sort of end up feeling a bit of pity for her. A bit of affection for her as they seem to just sort of continue along, um, continue along in their lives. Um, yeah, yeah, Edith, Edith. Um, I'm, I'm glad that Edith isn't someone we hate. Uh, that is someone there to hate. Uh, I, I was worried that that's where the book was turning, but it doesn't. And I'm also glad at the end, from the end of this chapter that Stoner's done something. That Stoner is in in, a, in some of this has felt very acted upon, um, but in the end he gets this kind of I don't fucking care anymore, and he takes on Lomax, and Lo, Lomax sort of crumbles, or at least seems to crumble. I guess we'll see in chapter fifteen how how that continues on. So yes, that is Stoner by John Williams. More videos later.